So if you've got your Bibles, if you could turn to Romans chapter 13, please. So we're at part 26 in our study on Romans. Um, and as you've heard the last couple of weeks, we're in the section now where it becomes very practical. Where the requirements of what is expected of us as believers to live out everything that we have heard, everything we've been taught in the first 11 chapters... Um, it comes down now really to Christian living in view of who God is and all that he has done for us. Um, we saw in chapter 12 that in view of his sacrifice, in view of what he has done for us, that we are called not to be worldly, but we're called to present our bodies as living sacrifices for him. To be transformed by the renewing of our minds, to serve him by serving one another. We saw there was a list of seven gifts, spirit-empowered abilities to serve God by serving the body. We saw those gifts in action in the following verses. And then we saw how it led into not just our relationship with one another and with God, but our relationship with society, wider society, looking at things like not taking vengeance, about not repaying evil for evil, about blessing those who curse us. And as we saw, these are not things that naturally come to us. These are things that we need the Holy Spirit's empowerment to be able to do from the heart, not just to do good deeds to look good on the surface, but so that God truly can work and live through us. Again, like we've said and like we've already seen in Romans, we cannot live the Christian life. It's only God who can live the Christian life through us. We've got to trust him, that's faith. We've got to depend on him and believe that he really can do it. And so as we come into chapter 13, I really wanted to try and do the whole chapter in one go. There's only 14 verses. Um, but I, I, I felt it was important to show how verse 8 if you have a quick look at chapter 13, the first seven verses is to do with our relationship to the, the governing authorities, the higher powers. And then as you come on into chapter, uh, sorry, verses 8 to 10, it's love for our neighbour. And then it moves on to, in, in view of these things, living right, living holy in view of the imminent appearing of Christ. And on the surface, it can look like it's a little bit disjointed. But as you run through, they actually follow on from each other. And I wanted to kind of bring that together. But I was going through it. I thought, I can't rush it. I don't want to rush it. So hopefully, again, we're at which next week, but the week after. If you stay with us, you'll see how the following seven verses, because we're only going to go up to verse seven this morning, do flow out of what we're going to be looking at this morning which is the believer's relationship to the governing authorities. And it's, uh, it's one of them passages where somebody's going to go away disagreeing. <laughs> there's, there's stuff to do in here about capital punishment, paying your taxes, submitting to the... You know, it's, somebody ain't going to be happy. <laughs> it's one of them. Um, but, I mean, there are things in here that I've changed my mind on in the last couple of years. You know, things that I've believed for, well seven, eight years or so, believed one way, and then after being pointed to something in the scriptures, actually changing what I believe the Bible says on it. So that might happen for one or two of you here this morning, but whatever the case may be, just be aware that we can hold on to views that we may have held on to for a long time. And it can be difficult, you know, if you feel yourself challenged, don't be guilty about it, because it can be difficult to change a long and strongly held view sometimes but we've got to remember God's word is the authority and he knows what is right he is just and he knows what he's doing okay so I'll just read through the first seven verses and um, it'd be a good thing to read through the whole chapter in the coming next week or two as well just to see how it does follow on but for this morning Romans 13 just verses 1 to 7 so Paul writes to the churches in Rome says, 
let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities or the higher powers. For there is no authority except from God and those which exist are established by God. Therefore he who resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. And they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. For the rulers are not a cause for fear for good behaviour, but for evil. Do you want to have fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God and an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. Wherefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes, for rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. Render to all what is due to them, taxes to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, and fear to whom fear, honour to whom honour. So as you can see from there, there might have been a few words that would have jumped out at you that may jar a little bit. However, like we know, often to explain a passage of scripture, we use other areas of scripture and it gives us a fuller picture and uh, helps us to guard against going along with our own feelings or our own imagination to let God's word truly speak. So, human government and when we say government I mean the King James Version it says higher powers we're not just talking about government it's, it's not that the Bible teaches just republics this is monarchies governments any ruling authorities they've been established by God himself they are not human originated institutions they are God's way of governing mankind that he established way, way back in Genesis. And I think it's important for us to begin there so that we see and understand that this is something that God has instituted as a way of um, administering, administering his rule in many ways on this earth. So if you can turn back with me to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, you'll be hard pushed to find any kind of teaching in the Bible that doesn't have some kind of seed in the book of Genesis. It's all there. Absolutely amazing. And uh, if we can just begin. First of all. Actually let's just go to chapter 9. So. In the we look at chapter 9. In the preceding chapters. God brought the worldwide flood. As judgment upon mankind. For the total wickedness that was, you know, saturated the whole of mankind. Noah and his family and the animals that were on the ark were saved. And when they came off, God established a covenant. Not only with Noah and his family, but with all of mankind. He established a covenant with all of mankind. And we see that in verse 9. He says, now I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. Now, part of this covenant involved some things in earlier passages. So we all know about this idea that God said that he was never going to destroy the world with a flood again. And you can be quite thankful of that, especially on mornings like this when you see it chucking it down. God put his rainbow in the sky, didn't he, as a symbol of his promise that he wouldn't destroy the world again with a flood. Also included in this, if we go back to verse 5, it says, And surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require it, and from every man, from every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. Why? For in the image of God he made man. Everybody, doesn't matter whether you love him or hate him, 
Every single person that's ever been born was created in the image of God. That's the value of human life. And it was such that God put down this principle that whoever murders, their life is required at the hands of men. Now this was something new. Let's just go back a little bit further. Remember the first person ever born to a woman was Cain. Cain and Abel. The first person ever born to a human woman was a murderer. And he murdered his brother. But what happened? God actually protected Cain's life. Cain said, look, if you send me out, people are going to know what's happened and people's going to want to kill me in revenge. We've got an inbuilt sense of justice. So God put a mark on Cain's forehead, if you remember, to protect him. So that's not what we see here in Genesis 9, is it? What about Lamech? Lamech boasted of killing a young man. He said, if Cain was going to be avenged, I'll be avenged seven times over. Nothing happened to him. So what we see here after the flood is a change in dispensation. We now see things change. Before the flood, eating animals wasn't the thing. After the flood, God now said, you can now eat everything that moves. There was another change. And now because of what happened, because of the evilness in mankind, God actually said at the end of chapter 8 in Romans, after Noah had come off the ark and presented a sacrifice to God, it says in verse 21, And the Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. Now listen. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth, and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. So man's heart hadn't changed after the flood. So how could prevention come for things to stop going back the way that they were when God decided or God was going to flood the earth. Does that make sense? I mean, it seems like we're heading that way now a little bit again, doesn't it? Something had to come about, so God implemented this rule now of capital punishment for murderers. And for that to be enforced, human government had to be instituted, so you've not just got a load of vigilantes running about taking things into their own hand. Human government had to be instituted to keep some kind of civil behaviour in society. And this is what happens. Nations came from Noah's three sons. And we see that then as you run through the Bible. So government was something set up by God. And in Daniel chapter 2, we see it explicitly stated that God raises up rulers and brings them down. And the book of Daniel says a lot about this subject. Daniel speaking in Daniel chapter 2 verse 20 says, Daniel answered and said, let the name of God be blessed forever for wisdom and power belong to him. And it is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and he establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. God raises up rulers and he removes rulers. Now, I don't know about you, but a question I've often had in the past is, well, what about the wicked rulers? If we're to be in subjection, to the governing authorities. What happens when people live under a regime that are wicked? The world's full of them, if we're honest, always has been. What about them? Doesn't matter. Doesn't make any difference. And that might be hard to hear. I mean, I hated the authorities in, in the old days, in, in the old life. I hated a lot of them, police, government, anybody that had any so-called authority over me. But that was because I was up to mischief. I was doing things that I shouldn't have been doing. And we'll come on to that in a bit. But no matter who it is, it doesn't matter. Now Nebuchadnezzar, in the days of Daniel, when Daniel was speaking this, he ended up in service to Nebuchadnezzar. God raised up Nebuchadnezzar to do his will. He wasn't a good man by a long stretch. It was the emperor of Babylon, 
the Babylonian Empire. What about when the Persians came after? They were no better, really. But Cyrus just turned. It's one of the most amazing prophecies in the Bible in terms of just really specifying. I mean, yeah, predictions or so-called prophecies from other religions and things like this, and they're pretty balmy, really. But when God gives a prophecy, he makes sure that it's not something half the time that's even probable. Now, Cyrus who was to become the emperor of the Persian Empire after the Babylonians. He was prophesied by name in the book of Isaiah about 200 years before he was born. Isaiah wrote down his prophecies around about 700 BC. Cyrus was born roughly a couple hundred years after that. And he is given a name. Isaiah 44, verse 28. This is God speaking through Isaiah. It says, It is I who say of Cyrus, He is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. Didn't just give the name, it said what he was going to do. It says, And he declares of Jerusalem, She will be built, and of the temple, your foundation will be laid. This was prophesied before Israel went into exile. The temple was destroyed. And it was Cyrus who gave the decree for the Jews to come back and rebuild the temple. Prophesied here 200 years before it happened. Now what about this guy Cyrus? You can read about him in the history books. The Cyrus cylinders in the British Museum. He was a wicked despot when you read about him. But God stirred up his mind to do this thing. And when you come down into Isaiah 45 and verse 4, It says, for the sake of Jacob, my servant, this is Israel, and Israel, my chosen one, I have also called you by your name, and I have given you a title of honor, though you have not known me. Cyrus didn't know God. But God gave him a title. God gave him honor, even though he never knew God. And you can go through the history books. You can go through the Bible. And this is the case book of romans let's just remind ourselves when paul wrote the book of romans who was the roman empire emperor at the time does anybody know nero the emperor nero now i'm sure we've all heard things about nero but one thing i'll tell you is nero used to have garden parties you can imagine the kind of things that happened there and these parties were at night and to light up the parties he would tie christians to the end of a big pole and light them on fire and that provided the lighting for these parties Paul was most likely had his head chopped off under the Emperor Nero a few years after he wrote this letter and it's to these people first and foremost and to us that Paul was writing this letter too so there is no excuse to say well I live in this country or now this government's come in or now Charles the third <laughs> slightly joking doesn't matter who's in power the institution of ruling authorities has been established by God and if we're in rebellion to them unnecessarily and I'll come on to that in a bit we're actually in rebellion to God himself so like I said there's many examples of this through the Bible God gave him authority even Pilate do you remember what Jesus said to Pontius Pilate in John chapter 19 when Jesus is on trial And Jesus won't speak. And Pilate says to the Lord Jesus Christ, Do you not know I have the authority to either release you or crucify you? And Jesus' response to him was, You would have no authority unless it had been granted to you by my Father. And it was true. Jesus even acknowledged Pilate's authority to crucify him. But it raises questions. The word is clear. It does raise questions. Now one thing that I would say is corrupt government is better than non-government. You end up with Lord of the Flies. And again, even from relatively recent history, you see, now I'm not at all condoning these particular individuals or their regimes, but look what happened when Gaddafi was removed from power. Libya, it's chaos. Not that evil things weren't happening, but as far as structurally in the society, chaos. Same with Saddam. 
even unofficial, um, unelected, unofficial rulers like Pablo Escobar. So a fascinating documentary a few years back, how he, he ran the areas that he had control over as obviously being a, a, a drug lord, but he kept things ordered. And when they took out Pablo Escobar, it was just chaos, absolute chaos. Corrupt government's better than no government. And this is often what we have to um, understand. Now, these kinds of things, particularly in today's age where lawlessness is everywhere, even in the West, even in countries that um, would be more civil. You see the rioting that's happened in America over recent years. Remember the riots down in London a number of years back? More and more authority in general, whether it's in school, whether it's, again, government, even in church. Authority is being looked down upon. People don't like it. So this teaching becomes particularly potent in days like today. Now then, if we come back to Romans 13... We'll see in verse 4, this is where it can get a little bit controversial for some. Speaking of the governing authorities, for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. For it is a minister of God and an avenger who brings wrath upon those who practice evil. Now what is a sword for? It's not for tickling, is it? So it's for killing. Now, from what I understand from the history books, the Caesars used to carry a dagger on their belt, and it was symbolic that they had the power of life or death over people. They had the authority to take life. Now, this was one thing that I believed for many years, that, well, it's, it's grace, isn't it? You know, we're in the age of grace and the church age and... You know, how, how on earth can you believe in capital punishment? Until it was pointed out to me that actually, not only was it there back in Romans, um, sorry, Genesis 9, but it's also here in Romans 13 as well. And so I'll try and explain this a little bit. One objection to this that often comes up is, well, that's Old Testament. That's Old Testament, we're in the New Testament. It's not right, it's not actually correct. Yes, there was the Mosaic Covenant that was established with Moses and the people of Israel at Sinai. And we are not under that law. There are lots of principles and there's so much good that's in there that we can learn from. But we are not under those laws as Christians after Christ has died and risen again for us. But the covenant that was made with Noah and the command for the life of murderers to be taken was made nearly a thousand years before the covenant made with Noah and it was a covenant was made with all mankind and it was never changed and it was unconditional before Israel was ever even a nation and so that principle has always been there and as we come up into Romans 13 it says the same thing Another objection is, well, is it not hypocritical? How can you talk about, does it not say in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill? Well, it's a misinterpretation of that commandment. When you look at that word in Hebrew, it's talking about thou shalt not murder. When wars take place, and we're obviously talking about just wars, killing is a necessity. As a horrible situation as it is, we live in a fallen world, but that's what it is. And so I think particularly for us living in a society where for a long time capital punishment has never even featured. Although I do believe even up until sometime in the late 90s for, what's that word for, it's seditions an American term I think, any. You know when you try and take out the monarchy there's a term for it, I forgot what that is now. But even up until the 90s in this country if you tried to do anything to the monarchy, um, yeah, you could, have, you could have ended up on death row, so to speak. But I don't think anybody's been killed in this country 
legally since the 60s maybe. So it can be a bit of a, a foreign concept to us where obviously there's still states in America that do carry this out. Well, there's a verse in Ecclesiastes, chapter 8, that's uh, it's quite insightful. Not a book of the Bible often turn to. You might unstick some of the pages in your Bible, this one. Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. It says, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. You understand? So essentially what he's saying is, is when evil isn't dealt with, it just grows in the hearts of men. There is no... Um, there's no deterrent against these things and ultimately I believe from God's point of view so much of this is to do with the protection of society if a murderer has had his life taken from him he's never going to murder anybody again is he and of course and it's something that we do also need to remember because somebody murders ends up in prison on death row and is up for execution doesn't mean that the grace of God for salvation through belief in the Lord Jesus Christ is not available to them I'm sure you like myself have heard many testimonies of people coming to faith in prison on death row some of the most wicked people Grant wrote a brilliant article um, a while back about you know you've heard of the son of Sam was it Sam Berkowitz his real name one of the most evil serial killers in American history came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ whilst in prison and when you read and listen to interviews speak to the guy the, the prison chaplain who worked with him I don't know questions that it was a genuine conversion even the most wicked people end up on death row the Lord is still there for them so it is not a case of damnation of any of these kinds of things but We've got to go with what the word of the Lord says. And we live in a country that is in rebellion to that. And um, it's not at all to go back to Moses and say, well, this person should be killed and this person. The only um, example we have from the word here is for those who take the life of another human being, of somebody created in God's image. This is what the Bible teaches. And again, it's something that I had to to look at again and, and, and change on and again it comes around and just to try and establish principles for these things when you go back to Genesis 6 and you read that the whole earth was filled with violence and destruction interestingly that word for violence by the way is Hamas I'm sure that ring a few bells and there you know there's been times where governments in the west have tried to validate them as a genuine political party almost call themselves violence anyway it says don't it that the, at that time the thoughts and intentions everything in man was only evil continually left to his own devices this is the trajectory of mankind without God's grace and without his provision, provision of human government to try and keep things civil this is how it goes so it's a mercy really and like it says here if you're doing the right thing you shouldn't have to worry about these things anyway so, if we move on, there's always so much more can be said about these things, but we do have to move through. Also says in verse 4 that the government, this is a, it's a minister of God. Now, it talks there about being an avenger of wrath. We saw in the previous chapter, didn't we? Don't take vengeance for yourself. Don't look for revenge says leave room for God because God says vengeance is mine this is one of the ways that God um, implements that through human government if someone commits a crime against you or your family you would hope the government would do something about it wouldn't you you would hope there will be some protection from the police you see how practical Christianity is kind of God's word 
you know, it really plays out into everyday life. But again, we've got circumstances nowadays where you've got all these riots in and things like, I think more so in America, defund the police. Remember all the Black Lives Matter riots were taking place and things like defund the police. What? Who wants to defund the police? People who break the law. I'd have been well up for that years ago. Yeah, get rid of the police, let me do what I want. But it's not right, is it? So, verse 5. It says, wherefore it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath. So it's good to be in subjection to the ruling authorities so that we don't come under the punishment. But it also says, for the sake of conscience. Now one of the things every single human being has been born with is a conscience. We saw that in the first chapter of Romans, or did it, I think it's actually the beginning of the second chapter. Everybody, Jew, Gentile, is born with a conscience. It's an innate knowledge of right and wrong. And we can subdue that conscience. We can even almost completely nullify it if we keep going against it. If we keep ignoring that little prick that is in our conscience when we do something wrong, eventually it will disappear. And I'm sure we've all experienced times where that has been the case. Well, I'd say you can come back to the Lord, come back to his word, and that conscience can be renewed and become sensitive once again. And it's a really healthy thing to have a sensitive conscience. But it's right to be right in the eyes of the authorities, but in the, in the eyes of God, you can get away with a lot of things, can't you? <laughs> not, not in the sight of God, we can't. And if we're to walk before him in the light, like we are told to do as, as children of the light. We need to have a clear conscience before God who sees everything. Our deeds, our words, and our intentions. He sees the heart. So we're to walk in a, clear, in a clear conscience in that sense. And in this context, it's speaking of obeying the authorities. You can get away with a lot. You can fiddle all your taxes. You can, you know, nick things without people seeing, whatever it may be. But God sees all, and we've got to have a, maintain a clear conscience. Paul spoke about that as being something very important, didn't he? How many times did Paul say, with, with, with a clear conscience before you, we shall be in fellowship with one another with a clear conscience. There should be a real openness about us. I was chatting with somebody about this earlier in the week. The, the, the guy was preaching on, in, um, I think it's Ephesians 4, where it says, I think in some of the translations, I'm going off a little bit here now, but don't let any lie come out of your mouth. But actually, it's don't let any falsehood come from you. So it's more than just a lie coming out of your mouth, it's just how you are in general. You know, especially Christians in this country, it's very uh, susceptible. You could have had a rotten week, you know, really struggling, and you get to church on Sunday morning, how are you doing? Yeah, it's home, mate. Yeah, it's home, man. You know, it's not lying as such, but it's not really presenting a true image of how you are. I think there's got to be real openness amongst the brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a healthy thing to have. And if we can do that before the Lord, first and foremost, I believe it will help amongst one another. You know, we want to be here for each other. You know, we want to help just like we've heard earlier this morning. You know, we want to grow together. We want to love together, support and uh, there's got to be an openness for us to actually be able to do that. But it all starts with being open and having a clear conscience before the Lord God himself. Now as we come on to verse 6, it says, Then, hold on to your purses, for because of this you also pay taxes. Because of what? Well, if you've got a government, they need funding. They need financial support to be able to govern We've got street lights, we've got libraries, we've got all kinds of things that we take for granted that come through taxpayers' money. Again, it raises the question, though, doesn't it? But where does a lot of that taxpayers' money also go? To the murder of unborn babies? To pay the wages of people who are against God and His Word and His people? So, what about paying taxes then? Doesn't matter. We've still got to pay them. They're, they're probably a, a, 
a fraction of money that you buy for everything or go to something by. Because everything's, everything is owned now by smaller and smaller groups. Amen. And when you look at these people that actually own these companies, so-called philanthropists, and you see where their money really goes, it's against God. Can't, but we can't live life in this day and age. I mean, Christ himself had to pay a temple tax. <laughs> you imagine that? That's his house. That's his house, and they asked him for temple tax. And he would have known full well that there was corruption going on there. There was a racket being run by the high priest family. They were cheating people out of good sacrifices that were fine and making them pay for the ones that were there, the money changers. It was corrupt right up to the eyeballs at that time. Jesus knew. He said, ah, just pay the, tax, pay the temple tax. They tried to catch him out on this subject, didn't they, when they said, is it lawful to pay tax to Caesar? Thinking that if Jesus said, no, don't pay taxes, he was in um, rebellion to the authorities and they could have had him. If he said, don't pay your taxes, but if he said, do pay your taxes, obviously all the Jews hated the Roman authorities, didn't they? You know, so then they would have been against him. But you remember what Jesus said, whose face is on the coin? But Caesar's. Well then, what about it? Just give to Caesar what he wants, but give to God what is due him. Jesus was not bothered about rebelling or causing revolution against the secular governing authorities. He wasn't. He was more concerned what was going on amongst God's people. What's going on in the church nowadays? And I tell you something, and I'm sorry if I seem like I'm going on sometimes. What has happened in the church this last couple of years with the lockdown, the pandemic, whatever your view is on it, there are some people's minds, even their ministries, have been overtaken with going on and on and on about this situation. And when you look at what they actually teach biblically, you think sometimes... Maybe it'd be better if you spent a little bit more time studying God's word and preaching that than going on and on and on about the evils of society. We know, it's, we know society's evil. I don't know what Christians expect. What do you expect from the government? What do you expect from people that don't have the love of God in their life? Don't go around insulting them. That don't do any good either. Call a spade a spade and tell the truth but without being rude and without seeing that our, our main focus is the Lord and his word and what goes in and on here amongst us and to share that love and that light with those that don't yet know the Lord. You see how Jesus went about things. It says also there at the end of verse 7 as well, honour and honour to whom honour is due. Just turn with me please to First Peter. There's a kind of parallel passage to what we're looking at here in Romans 13. In 1 Peter, we've got Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, chapter 2. Verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as to the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and to the praise of those who do right. Very similar to what we've just read. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honour all men. Love the brotherhood. That's the Christian brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honour the king. Now again, we've obviously just had a new king ascend to the throne. I'll be honest with you, I don't like a lot of the things that he has said in the past. I think he's said some pretty ridiculous things. May not even like him as a person. Might not trust him. But he's there because the Lord has put him there. And we've got to honour him for that. Can't be rude. Show him the honour and the respect that is due to him. What does he say in um, 1 Timothy chapter 2? Pray for your leaders. Pray for them. 
That will also help as well if you find yourself harboring real hatred and bitterness towards anybody, but even the, the rulers, as wicked as they may be. If you pray for somebody that you don't like and see the Lord's heart change, see the Lord change your heart there, you know. But it says there in Timothy, the reason for it being there, that we may live a quiet and tranquil life, especially as believers. And I'll come on to this in a, in a little minute. That we may have the freedom to meet together, that we may have the freedom to share the gospel without getting arrested. These kinds of things, it's important to do it. And you never know what may happen in the, in the governing authorities. Christians may get into places of authority. People may get converted there. I heard a few years back, whether it still happens, I hope so, it'd be nice to think so, but at least up until a few years ago in the House of Commons, there was a group of Christian MPs that would get together, I think it might have been before Prime Minister's questions, and pray together in the House of Commons. That can have a mighty impact on the country when these things are happening. So God's word says to pray for these people, whether you like them or not. So, as we've seen, God has put government in its place. God raises leaders, God removes leaders, and we are to be in subjection. Like I said, all these things raise a lot of questions. One other question is very important is, is there ever a valid reason to not obey the governing authorities? And based on God's word, not on how I might feel or how you might feel, based on God's word, there are occasions where we don't have to go along with what the governing authorities say. But we've got to be absolutely sure that it's based on God's word and not again our, our own inclinations even on what we think is right and wrong so we've seen that being in rebellion to the governing authorities is being rebellion to God but what happens when the governing authorities try and implement something that goes against God's word what do we do then we go with God's word he is the highest authority when you see in the um, in the Greek, in the first verse in chapter 13, it'd be, it's a little bit clearer, I suppose, than what it is there in English, but it says, for there is no authority except from God. In the Greek, it said, God is the highest authority. He is the highest authority. He is the one who put those in authority there. He's the one who put them there. Who put the sword in the hand of the government? God did. Now, in the book of Acts, there are a couple of occasions where this was challenged. In Acts chapter 4, the apostles have been preaching Christ and essentially told not to preach Christ anymore. And in verse 19, in Acts chapter 4 and verse 19, they were told not to teach all or speak in the name of Jesus. In verse 19, it says, But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge. For we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. Similarly, in the next chapter, Acts chapter 5. Verse 29. Again, when they were told not to preach anymore, verse 29, it says, But Peter and the apostles answered and said, Very simply, we must obey God rather than men. Shouldn't go looking for loopholes in things, trying to find and, and twist God's word to provide loopholes for things that we're not happy or in agreement on the government with. We've got to be very, very careful if there ever comes a time where we feel that the, the law of the land is contrary to what God's word says. We've got to be very careful that we are clear that this is what God's word says and we go by that. And I believe that there has been examples in the last couple of years of this. We've been blessed as people living in this land like others in America, but things are starting to change. 
and like we know in the last two years it was um, the case that churches were being told to shut down the people weren't allowed to sing hymns to God even when they were reopened baptisms couldn't take place couldn't have communion these kinds of things now then not as a matter of opinion on whatever I know people have different views on the whole situation with the pandemic and things like that but who has authority in the church only God Christ is the head of the church read Colossians chapter 1 Christ is the head of the body which is the church even elders pastors whoever vicars reverends whatever they call themselves don't have the authority in the church to close the church down the body of Christ has got to meet together physically zoom I heard from somebody in a, a very high up position in a Christian organization saying we've got to toe the government line because we can still meet over zoom that's not meeting together Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 says very clearly verse 24 I'll go back a verse and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near that word there for assembling together epi synagogue it's where it comes from that word synagogue and it means a physical assembly. When you look at that word in the Greek, it's to, to do with the actual place where the people meet. Can't meet over the internet waves or whatever. I don't even understand how the internet works. It's better than nothing. Don't get me wrong. It's been amazing to see how God has used people being able to meet over the internet. And so people have come into meetings through things like Zoom that otherwise would have never have been able to. But it has also happened... <laughs> that people who used to physically meet together now just meet on Zoom because it's easier and miss out on the physical fellowship, on the physical assembling together that God's word speaks about. On any, just think of an assembly line, the parts of a watch on an assembly line. When they're separate, that, that watch don't do anything. It's much needed and the government has no authority to close churches down. Has no authority when the meetings are open as to what the church does another area where the government has no authority is in your family and in my family it's an institution ordained by God way before he instituted human government in Genesis 9 family was established in Genesis chapter 2 The man belongs to the woman, the woman belongs to the man. The children are a gift from God to the parents. Psalm 127. Children are a gift from God to the parents. Just quickly, and we nearly finished. Ephesians chapter 6. And this is something that is being challenged more and more, more so on the continent in Europe. Um, but Ephesians chapter 6 says, Children, obey your parents. Not the government. Not the school. Obey your parents. Now, of course, if the parents are doing their job, the parents will be teaching the children to obey the government, obey in school. But it says, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honour your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may be well with you, and you will live long on the earth. And fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's your responsibility and that's my responsibility as parents. It is not the school's responsibility to teach your children. It's their job, it's what they're supposed to do. But it's not their responsibility as far as God is concerned. That's your responsibility and mine. You know they're teaching a load of wickedness in the schools now anyway. It's not about edgy, it's not about teaching facts and knowledge. 
It's social engineering now. They're not even interested in teaching correct grammar and spelling and things like that. That's why I speak like this. <laughs> but this is our response of they belong to us, they're our children. We were actually, when we told some, told some people that we were going to homeschool, the reply straight away from one of us, you, you, you don't own your children. Honestly. It's not what God's word says. So, with things creeping in Germany, for example, there was a, a family homeschooling in Germany. They were put under arrest. They fled to America. It's starting to creep in, in certain places. Monitoring things like that. Church is being shut down. Pastors being told to submit their sermons to the local authorities before they get preached in the church. Evangelists getting arrested on the street for evangelizing. It's starting to happen more and more. So, what does this mean for us? It means that potentially more and more as these things start to develop, that we have got to take a stand with God and his word and be faithful to him. If we choose to go against the governing authorities and stay with what God's word says, you, you've got to be prepared to accept the consequences. You can't moan if something happens, whether it's arrest or whatever it may be, because we just have to be prepared to accept it. And remember that it's not just about our actions as to what we do in these situations. It's also, and this is very important, it's the manner by which we do it as well. You might have seen a video um, during lockdown that everybody was, all like, Christians were praising this video. I think it was in Canada, it might have been Australia. Police breaking into a church service. And uh, the pastor just berating these police, screaming his head off and calling them Nazis and fascists, you know, all kinds of things. It was wrong for the police to break into the service and try and break it up. It was. But it was even worse for that pastor to start shouting at them in the manner and the way that he did, calling them every name under the sun. Because he's supposed to have the light. He is supposed to have the Holy Spirit in him. It's every, every chance that those, those police didn't. They were just doing what they'd been told to do. You don't see Jesus behaving like that. You don't see Paul behaving like that. Even when Paul was under arrest, you see how respectfully they spoke to the authorities. Look at Daniel and his friends. O king, speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. They were getting chucked in the fire for not worshipping the statue. There's another example of not following the authorities when it goes against God's word. Daniel's friends, worship this statue that I've made of myself. Now you wicked, stupid idiot of a king, we're not doing that, we worship God. They didn't say that, oh king, we can't do that, we worship the true God. Even if it means we lose our life for it, they still spoke respectfully. There are examples of these things happening in the Bible, the beginning of Exodus, the Hebrew midwives. When Pharaoh told them, kill all the boys, all the boys that are born, you kill them. But they didn't, did they? Because God's word supersedes any human authority. But we've got to be very careful that we don't use this principle to suit our own bias in certain situations and to be prepared as well for what may be coming more and more in this country against Christians, against believers. And to remember when these things come, don't lose your focus. Don't take your eyes off our Lord and Saviour. It's him that will get us through it. And he'll get us through it in the right way. We saw earlier in the week, and I am finishing. I know I've said that about three times. Just been going in Matthew chapter 4. And so much through the Bible, we see when Christ came to the earth 2,000 years ago, the humility and the submission of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ to his heavenly Father and to the authorities is the example set to us. He didn't have an attitude of insurrection, a rebellion, or come to bring a revolution is what some people try and teach. He didn't have that in him. And he's our example. 
is how we are to follow. So not just in our actions, but in, in how we speak to people who are against us. We read in the previous chapter, bless those who curse you. Don't return evil for evil. You know what a witness that can be to somebody. And playing a part in maybe bringing them to the Lord. These things are so important for us as believers. You can know all the doctrine in the world. Know the whole book of Psalms off by heart, whatever. But if we're not living this out, if it's not in our heart, it means nothing. God has given us a life to live. He gave his life for us to live this life. He has given us the ability to do it. And for us together, as a fellowship, for us individually and in our family, and as a witness to a lost world that doesn't know him, these things are vital. They really are as unpopular as they might be at times. In the sight of God, this is what is right and this is what is good. So we'll leave it there for this morning. If there are any, any questions or all, any points of discussion, please do feel free to ask at any time. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to keep talking. But let's just finish with a prayer.